you know, as long as you're consistent, as long as you are um, committed to your goals, I really think that in the long picture, right, the money will compound over its own. And, you know, I, I am a very strong believer that anyone can, you know, achieve great wealth, no matter what kind of income that you're making. I personally think that as long as you have the right mindset, as long as you have the right strategy for it, then anyone can do this. That includes grassroots. Welcome to the Personal Finance for PhDs podcast, a higher education in personal finance. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Roberts. This is season 11, episode four, and today my guest is Min Sub Lee, a fourth year PhD candidate in molecular and medical pharmacology at UCLA. Over the past year, Min Sub has developed a side hustle in options trading, which is selling or buying the option or right to sell or buy stock. Min Sub teaches us what covered calls, put options, and put credit spread options are. He shares how he learned this technique and why he thinks it's a good fit for a graduate student's budget and schedule. Minsub keeps this strategy low risk by limiting it to only a small fraction of his investment portfolio and making small, consistent bets. This content is not advice for financial, legal, or tax purposes, and if you're interested in options trading, please do extensive research before you begin. I have a new little project that I'd love for you to participate in. I'm crowdsourcing information on what tax forms are being issued for various fellowship and training grant funding sources. I've published an article with the data I've collected so far at pfforphds.com slash tax form. So if your stipend or salary was from a fellowship or training grant issued from the NIH, NSF, Ford Foundation, DOD, DOE, Hertz Foundation, Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship Program, Life Sciences Research Foundation, American Association of University Women, etc., or an internal fellowship source, please fill out the survey linked from pfforphds.com slash tax form to help out other people with the same type of funding who are confused about the tax form they received or lack of tax form. Thank you. Without further ado, here's my interview with Min Sub Lee. I'm delighted to have joining me on the podcast today, Min Sub Lee. He is a current graduate student at UCLA, and we are going to discuss options trading, which is a form of investing that I know nothing about. So it's very exciting for me to get to learn alongside probably many of you listeners. So Min Sub, would you please introduce yourself a little bit further for the listeners? Yeah. Hi, Emily. Um, very nice to meet you. Um, it's very good to be here. Um, my name is Min Sub. Um, I'm currently a fourth year um, PhD candidate. Um, I'm currently studying the molecular and medical pharmacology at the University of California, Los Angeles. And um, I am very passionate about financial ed- education, financial literacy, and um, hopefully I can provide some good value to my audience who, are not, who may not be familiar with um, how options work and you know all the good stuff. Yeah, sounds great. Um, I am definitely in that audience. So I am, as longtime listeners know, I am a dyed-in-the-wool passive investor. I set up my investments a decade ago and <laughs> have not touched them since because I'm very happy with how things are going. Um, so active, actively investing is not something that I do and it's not something that I teach. But of course, I want to learn about it and I'm happy to share the information with um, the listeners as well. Um, so, Minsev, let's start with what are options and how does this differ from what we might otherwise think of as like stock trading? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, um, most of us are probably familiar with the concept of buying shares of a company. So essentially, when we purchase, let's say, 100 shares of, you know, your favorite company, you know, let's say McDonald's or something or, you know, Walmart or Target. Well, that basically means that you are essentially part owner of a company's equity. Now, Options are something that I honestly never considered um, doing until this year Um, because, you know, you might hear in the media saying that, well, you know, people have like um, made, you know, made lots of money on their options, right? People basically, you know, put their entire life savings into options, they basically lost it all. So options really have a very negative sort of like um, vibe on overall market trading. But I actually wanted to, you know, change that sort of like um, sentiment today because Options trading can actually be very profitable and very, very safe if you do it correctly, right? So essentially what options are is that options are basically, it's a right um, or some kind of a contract to buy or um, sell um, typically 100 shares of a company. 
So here's an example that I usually tell my friends whenever they ask me about, you know, about options. So let's say that you are a home buyer and I am a home seller, right? So I'm currently, I currently own a house that is currently selling for about $500,000 right now. And you are interested in buying my house. However, you currently do not have the full $500,000 in cash, but you are willing to essentially have the right to buy my house. So you, let's say that you pay me $100,000 of quote unquote premium. And what the premium st states is that you basically ask me if you can buy my $500,000 house for $200,000 with a $100,000 premium. Um, and essentially how, how the worst is, you know, typically when we have those contracts, we set some kind of a contract date and some kind of a strike price. So essentially, let's say in three years, if even if my house, let's say appreciates to $1 million, because you have a contract with me stating that you have the right to buy my house for $200,000, essentially you could buy my house at total of $300,000 if you add up your initial premium plus the, the amount that, that you're willing to pay for. So that is in a nutshell how options work. And, you know, obviously things can go wrong both ways because, you know, my house can easily collapse to, you know, zero dollars, right? So in that case, you know, then your premium might be worth, you know, deemed worthless. But at the same time, you know, like if my house appreciates to, you know, $10 million, right, then you can technically, you know, buy my house for the premium price that we've sort of contracted for. Now, the, the truth is, um, for the most part, people who buy these, call, you know, we call these call option contracts, many of these premium expire worthless. And what that means is typically what, what happens is, you know, like either the price did not appreciate in value as they wanted. So basically their contracts just become worthless, right? Um, or, you know, the other concept is that sometimes over time, there's a concept called data decay, which means even if you hold an options contract for, let's say, three years, if you do not exercise that contract for some time, the data decay essentially um, can actually wear off part of your option contract every, on, on a daily basis. So essentially, people's contract just becomes worthless, be one, because the actual security price doesn't appreciate or because of the fact that data decay has essentially just devalued the entire contract on its own and your premium is just deemed worthless at the point. So there's different ways how people can exercise options, but typically, you know, I say about 90% of the time, you know, people who own call options typically are on a losing streak. But, but, you know, in the end, they're not losing a lot of money because they're only paying a small premium to essentially have the contract, if that makes sense. I Sorry. see. Yeah, so it, it does, actually. And I'm not sure how familiar the listeners are with this, but I don't know the stats on this exactly. But it turns out that, like, over the many, many decades, you know, 90 plus percent of the value that's been created in the U.S. economy is coming from, like, the tail end of stocks that have done, like, incredibly well, whereas the vast majority of companies either, like, break even or lose money, like, over the long term. Mm -hmm. um, and so right, it sounds right. similar to that. So, like, a lot of the bets that you're going to make if you get enter into this um, are going to not turn out in your favor. But because you're making right. small mm -hmm. bets, you only have to win mm -hmm. big a certain percentage of the time exactly. to overall come out ahead. Exactly. Yes. Which is why, you know, when people typically buy options, they only, you know, play with a very small percentage of their portfolio because it is money that people can live without. Right. But, you know, if the contract goes well, then people can make lots of money in that sense. Right. OK, so I think we have the basic idea of what options are. So then how do you approach options trading in such a way that you think you're going to come out ahead mostly? Right. So. I mean, there are different ways to win in options trading. So how about this? Let me start with actually some of the safer ways to start options, because I think, you know, most people still think of options as, as a fundamentally evil thing and they just sort of, you know, fear losing a lot of money. And that is, you know, not wrong. You know, if you play options really incorrectly, if you really think that you could sort of win big with options, right? You're you're not thinking the right mindset, right? Because in the end, options should be only about 20% max of your total portfolio. For me, you know, I only play with maybe 10% of my total, um, you know, security asset in portfolio, mainly because I know that if I lose that 10%, you know, I'm not going to lose my sleep on that, right? If I heard you correctly, what you're saying is that about 90% of all the money you have available to be invested is not invested under this strategy. You're doing maybe Correct. a long-term diversified 
index situation probably. C- correct. Okay, good to know. Okay, so we're talking about this fraction of your portfolio and the strategy that you're using in that. Please continue. Correct, yes. Yeah, so um, there are actually three sort of strategies that I adopted um, upon options. And I really think that these strategies are very, very useful for anyone to get started, um, mainly because they're out there. First of all, they're risk-free, right? Um, well, technically, there are still some risks to, to options. So, I mean, so don't think that this is actually something that it's guaranteed to make money because if you do it incorrectly, you will lose part of something. Um, so the first strategy I'm going to talk about is actually a strategy called a covered call option. So how this works is, so the one requirement that you have to have for this for the strategy is that you must own 100 shares of some security, some stock um, class. Um, and basically uh, here is what's happening. So let's say that you have these 100 shares of a company or of some stock, and this stock has not been moving for the past year, or this stock basically has been trading sideways. You know, maybe it's been swinging up and down, but maybe like plus or minus, two to five percent, you know, on a flat basis, right? And, you know, like you're looking at your other, you know, stocks like Tesla, you know, and, you know, like other, those big stocks and, and, and you know, you're jealous because, you know, you, you, you kind of want to, you know, like start liquidating some of this and start to, you know, and, you know, maybe consider putting your money into cl- asset classes that actually do appreciate more value. Um, so instead of doing that, right, which I don't recommend, you should never um, just jump and just liquidate your cash just to jump on a hot stock because, just because it's moving up like 20% a year, you know, on a weekly basis. But essentially what cover, how cover calls work is you can basically um, kind of say that I think that the current stock that I'm owning is not going to go above 10% in value in the next certain time. Right. So let's say that, you know, by next month, by, you know, December 3rd or something. Right. Um, you know, my 100 shares, I do not expect these shares to go above a certain price. So what we can do is we can actually sell a covered call and receive a premium. So basically, I am kind of betting that because I sort of know um, on a high chance basis that I don't think that these shares will go above a, a certain strike price. I am willing to sell a covered call option um, on my current shares. And with that, you can actually earn some t- roughly between about 2 to 3% of your current um, assets. So let's say that you own about 100 shares worth of you know, your favorite stock, Pinterest, let's say, right? And you, know, you, you currently have about, let's say, uh, $5,000 worth of Pinterest. And you, know, you can sell a covered call option and receive about you know, 2 to 3% of your, um, of your current holdings. And if, you're, if your bet is correct, Right. If you if you are correct in a sense that Pinterest did not go above ten percent in value, then you're basically going to keep that premium. Right. You're basically going to keep your current shares, and you're also going to keep the premium. And we can actually do this on a weekly basis because we can actually sell a weekly cover call options on your securities. So essentially, you know, for stocks that you believe that you don't really expect them to move on on a really volatile basis, then this is a very good strategy to actually sort of earn passive income. It's kind of like earning dividends, you know, on your stock, right? Um, To to an extent. Now, the the downside, you know, of course, is Pinterest might all of a sudden skyrocket, right? You know, there there might be a really good news on, you know, something, let's say there's an acquisition purpose and, you know, like Pinterest might literally go up 30%. Well, in that case, you're kind of screwed because you promised to sell 100 shares of your security at a specific strike price. And if the price of Pinterest has gone up way over your strike price, then there's a high likely chance that you'll be called out, which means you know you will still get your premium, but you're forced to sell your 100 shares of a company at a target price. So typically selling a cover call is very, very good and very good a viable option um, for stocks that typically don't move too much. You know, stocks like Apple, like Microsoft, you know, these stocks that tend to have a very low volatility and, you know, th- you know stocks that typically have very low, you know, like up, ups and downs are very good uh, ways to actually utilize cover call options as a strategy. I've been, you, you know, using this option for quite a while and I have made pretty decent income. And so far I have not, I have never got called out yet. So um, hopefully I can, you know, stay that way for next, you know, whatever years I continue to do, you know, do options. With that example, 
is this is the price that you agree to sell that stock for what you're calling the strike price? So like in your example, it was that like 10% above wherever the price was Correct. when you made this bet. So I guess what I'm thinking is um, for you as the person who is, you know, currently owning these hundred shares, basically you get money if your stock doesn't move that much, or if it goes up quite a lot, you still get more than you had in the first place because you're selling at that slightly higher price. It's not, it's just not as high as it could have gone had you never put that. Right. You said it's a covered Ex call, exactly. right? Yeah. Perfect. So yes, exactly. Yeah. So I, I see the attraction here. <laughs> Yeah, so like I said, right, it's very um, good for stocks that don't really have a high volatility because, you know, if your stock goes, let's say, down, right, that's, you know, it still sucks because your stock went down, right, but you're not going to be called out. But, you know, if your stock, let's say, suddenly goes up to like 20%, then, you know, it's, it's an opportunity cost that you sort of gave up because of a premium, in that sense. So that is one, you know, downside, but um, overall, like, you know, if you feel like there is a security that you just, you know, want to hold for a long time, but one, you know, one little bit more passive income, then this is one really good strategy to do so. I guess a further follow up question about this, this a little bit relates to like how feasible is that, is it for a graduate student to do this? To own 100 shares of a stock, the stock has to be fairly low in price, right? For right, that right. to be manageable mm -hmm. for a grad student kind of income. So like, for instance, when you have done this strategy, what is the, the stock price or some examples of stock prices that you've you've done this for? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I've been trading for some time, about two and a half years now. Um, and honestly, like when I first started the strategy, I didn't start with cover call options. I actually started with another option trading that I slowly, you know, started to accumulate a little bit of cash on the side. And I'll, and I'll actually get to that strategy, which is actually much more feasible and practical for grad students. Um, but right now, I currently only, um, if, if, you know, if I already you know, be transparent with my portfolio, I currently own 100 shares of Lemonade right now. Um, so Lemonade is actually an insurance company um, that, I really um, believe that there's a good f good future growth to this. But Lemonade also has been um, trading sideways for a long time. Right now, Lemonade is turning, trading for about $62, um, if I'm looking at it correctly. Um, and it's been like this for about the past three months. So, um, and you know, like I am simply just using the strategy to, you know, some, to essentially to like gain a little bit of passive income on a weekly basis to at least, you know, get something out of it. Hmm. Okay. So the way that you're using this strategy is you have what you want to be a long-term holding, um, but you don't expect it to take off anytime soon or do much movements yeah. anytime soon. So you're making, as you said, some income from it in the meantime. Right, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Well, I think you said there were three sort of approaches that you wanted to cover for options trading. So what's the second one? Yeah. So the second one is actually a um, little bit similar to the cover call option. Um, so the second one is called a selling a cash secured put option. So how this works is um, basically you are obligated to this time instead of sell, you're obligated to actually buy 100 shares of a company that you like. Okay. Um, so I currently do not have much um, sold puts going on right now. Um, but let's say that you have a company. Okay. Um, I don't know. Let's say that you really want to buy Costco or something, right? Or, and but you know you currently don't like the price right now because Costco, let's say, is trading for about you know three hundred and fifty dollars. I don't know, I haven't checked, but let's say it is. But you know you really want to buy, own Costco at a lower price. So what you could do is you could actually sell a put option. And how that works is for a put option, you actually need a collateral this time. So in the case of a covered call, your collateral was your 100 shares of a security. But for a put option, your collateral is actually cash. That's why it's actually called a cash secured put option. And because an option contract typically, you know, moves 100 shares at a time, you know, in this, I mean, maybe Costco is not a good example in this case, but basically we need to have, you know, so if you're willing to buy Costco at $320, then you need to have a cash security collateral of about $32,000 in your account, which might seem impractical for, for grad students, but that's kind of like how put options work. And basically what happens is you also get a premium on that. So you can basically put your collateral up and then you also receive a premium based on that collateral. So if Costco, let's say, never um, goes down to 320, let's say, right? It's, you know, let's say Costco just moons and let's say it just stays at 350. Well, then good news is that your premium is still yours. You get to keep that premium and you actually get to keep your collateral, 
right? Because you know, basically in a put option, you're obligated to buy the off buy the shares. But if your strike price is has not reached below your expectation, then you know after a week, right? Um, essentially your put options will expire worthless, and you get to keep your money and you get to keep your premium essentially. Now. I really like like puts because here's and you know put option. I think it's really a never um, losing strategy. Let's say that Costco actually does go down to three twenty. Let's say, well, remember, the reason why you've done it in the first place is because you're actually willing to pay that much money for Costco, right? So in in a sense, it's not a losing game because that was your original bet, right? You were you for you you have an entry strategy and you wanted to basically buy hundred shares. So even if Costco, you know, falls after earnings or something, you know, let's say it falls after 319, well, then yeah, you'll be called out, right? You will lose your collateral and you're, you're forced to basically buy 100 shares. But the good thing about that is let's say that, you know, you just don't like Costco anymore all of a sudden. You can always, you know, sell those 100 shares back in the market, right? And essentially, if, you know, you might, if, if that happens, then you technically you get your collateral back and you also get to keep the premium that you originally got, you know, set it for. So I really think that put option is a very attractive strategy. Um, the only downside, of course, is that you know you need to have a lot of collateral depending on what kind of security you're trying to buy. But other than that, I really think that put option selling puts are very um, lucrative, um, especially if you're just you know if you have some cash that you really don't have have no idea how to spend it, but you know you're willing to at least keep your cash as collateral, then you can sort of receive some passive income premiums, on that sense. I sold puts um, quite often, you know, during the spring when the market was very red, um, and you know I've made pretty good income from that. So I'm very happy at that, about the choice. Um, right now the market is doing really well, so put options are not very attractive right now. But um, you know the next time we enter a bear market, I'm hoping to you know like consider um, selling more puts if I have some more cash just you know on the sideline. So one follow up question again, I'll use your example and thank you for giving one. So in your example, you agree to buy Costco at. 320 but you mentioned let's say it fell to 319 what if it falls to 200 so are you still agreeing to buy at 320 exactly yes so that is a risk of of selling puts right so essentially um you know again which is why you should not do a put option contracts on stock with a very high volatility you know costco has a very you know fairly a low volatility it's deemed a very safe stock you know its p multiple is very low so you know i personally don't think that Costco will drop that much money unless there is some kind of a really um, bad earnings report or really bad guidance or something. But you know, usually when you, either your cover calls or or selling puts, you should not do these strategies on really volatile stocks because we, like you said, we know for a fact that if it goes in both ways, we are kind of screwed. Um, so that's a very good follow-up point, and, and thank you for mentioning that. Okay, thank you. Emily here for a brief interlude. Taxes are weirdly, unexpectedly difficult for funded grad students and fellowship recipients at any level of PhD training. Your university might send you strange tax forms or no tax forms at all. They might not withhold income tax from your paychecks even though you owe it. It's a mess. I've created a ton of free resources to assist you with understanding and preparing your 2021 tax return, which are available at pfforphds.com slash tax. I hope you will check them out to ease much of the stress of tax season. If you want to go deeper with the material or have a question for me, please join one of my tax workshops, which are linked from pfforphds.com slash tax. I offer one workshop on preparing your annual tax return for graduate students and one workshop on calculating your quarterly estimated tax for fellowship and training grant recipients. It would be my pleasure to help you save time and potentially money this tax season, so don't hesitate to reach out. Now back to our interview. And what's the third the third um, strategy? Great. Yes. So this is a strategy that I really, really like because I think um, this is a great strategy for all grad students because unlike cover calls or, you know, cash secured puts, you don't actually need a whole lot of security or, you know, a whole lot of you know collateral. Basically, this is called a put credit spread option strategy. And how this works um, is essentially you, you have a put option that are going both ways at the same time. So essentially you are selling a put 
but you're also simultaneously buying a put at the same time, right? So here's an example that I thought of um, yesterday, right? So let's say that you are selling a put option for Apple, right? So Apple is, is you know, let's, let's say it's trading around $147 as of now. Um, and remember what that means is if you're only selling a cash care put, you are basically putting $14,700 as a collateral because you're willing to buy Apple at that strike price, right? But what if you don't have that much money? What if you actually don't have that cash? Well, then you could actually, you know, take that advantage and, and actually do the opposite. You could actually buy a put option for the same company, but at a lower strike price. So essentially, um, let's say you sold a put for 147, but you're actually now going to buy a put option for the same security, but at a lower price, let's say 146, right? And then remember, when, you are, when you're selling a put, you are receiving a premium. And when you're buying a put, you're actually paying a premium for that security. So essentially, you're actually receiving the difference on the premium between your sold put and your bought put. So if your sold put was, let's say, $37 of credit, but your bought put is $23 in credit, that means your net credit on this, on, on this um, put credit strategy would be $14, right? Because you're basically receiving a difference between your sold put and your bought put, right? And you know, of course, we, and you still need to have some collateral and how the collateral works is basically, it's the difference between your strike price of your sold put and the strike price of your bought put. So if you sold your put for 147 and you bought your put for 146, the difference is $1, right? But remember, because options operate for 100 shares, your total collateral that you'll be paying for is $100. Right, but you're actually receiving a premium of fourteen dollars. So think about it. So if you put it that way, so if your collateral was one hundred dollars and your premium, your your net premium was fourteen dollars, that's about a fourteen percent um, profit from your collateral. And if you you know if you're correct, if you're correct that Apple basically did not go below your put price, then you know you can actually keep your premium and your collateral. And the beauty thing about this put spread strategy is that unlike the cover puts, or unlike the cover calls, you don't need to have 100 shares. You don't need to have, you know, basically a lot of cash um, as a collateral. So I really think this is a really good strategy. And I've actually been doing this for quite a while, um, um, sometime in January of this year. And, um, you know, I've been doing this on, on a weekly basis. Um, and the good, also the one good thing about the strategy is that um, there are actually um, ETFs that you, you can do this. So ETFs like um, SPY and QQQ, those two are the two you know um, great ETFs for the strategy. Um, mainly because these ETFs actually have three different strike dates per week, right? So basically Monday, Wednesday, and Friday they have a different strike um, expiration date. So essentially, if you do this correctly, you, you can actually do this three times a week. And if you, you know, let's say you sold about, you know, three contracts per, you know, on, you know, like um, every every two days. And if you make about, let's say, um, to be conservative, let's say about $8 per contract. Well, that's still about $24, you know, on that expiration date. But if you multiply that by three days, that's still about you know seventy four dollars of just profit that you're making from this uh, of the strategy, and you know like I think I, I kind of can figure out your next question. Is this actually a very you know like good um, time commitment for grad students? Because you know it might sound like this is a very long, very time lucrative, and you know very very um, time sensitive. And the truth is, the when you first learn how to do this, it does require a little bit of you know time to sort of like learn this. But honestly, like once you get more comfortable with these strategies, all you really have to have to do is simply just wake up in the morning and then you know just open your broker's account in like on your on your phone or it could be on on your computer and just trade these options for you know maybe like the first like fifty minutes of your of the market open and that's it. Once as long as your security is sold, then you can just you know put on your computer, go and go on a hike, you know get your breakfast, go to lab, and you know like not worry about it until the next expiration date, which is you know typically in two days. So I really think that this is a really good, very good um, tangible strategy that anyone can actually um, utilize, um, whether it's grad students or whether you're just um, trying to get started with options. 
if someone is listening and is really interested in pursuing this strategy, but they have no idea where to start, um, where would you recommend they go to learn more about how to execute these options trades, but also, you know, the research into like, you know, which particular stock should you be doing, which particular, you know, option trade for? So like, what are some really great sources that you've learned from um, in the past few months and years? Right. So here's the thing. So when I first learned about just stocks in general or options in general, I actually started with paper money um, because I personally don't like losing money. <laughs> and, you know, like learning something new like this, um, I, you know, even if it's like a hundred bucks, I mean, even if, you know, that might be a small percent of my portfolio, I don't like losing money. I mean, so like I would rather be somewhat of an intermediate expert on this field um, before I actually use real currency. So, you know, there are actually, you know, like online, you know, sources, you know, um, that you could use. I think um, I think that the one that I used was actually called the Stock, Stock Watch, I think, um, something. But basically, there are a lot of paper trading um, platforms where you can sort of like play with fake money and see if this strategy works for you. And once you are comfortable with trading fake money and once you have profited, maybe maybe even become a millionaire <laughs> with, the, with, with, the, with the paper money, you can, you know, I think by then, you know, maybe about... To me, you know, to, for me, it took about, about maybe a good three weeks to be more comfortable with this. So um, it was a very good learning period for me. And, you know, I, I'm very glad that I took the time to actually learn about this because now, you know, again, like I said, the time investment, you know, initially might be a little painful. It's, it's a sort of a big climb. But once you are comfortable with the level of, you know, risk-free trading, then honestly, this becomes a very routine task for me. Um, so... So, so I started using a, you know, a paper, you know, trading currency, but, you know, there are a lot of YouTube videos out there nowadays. Um, if you just, you know, look up, you know, how to sell cover call options, how to sell put options, right? How to do a put credit spread. There are many, many sources that people actually use. And there are actually, you know, plenty of day traders online who actually record their, you know, online, you know, videos on live and they actually show how to execute certain trades and they actually do tutorials on this so there are actually endless amount of resources that, that anyone can get started um, with this strategy so if anyone is really interested in actually starting you know to learn a little bit about options you know how to actually trade options in a risk-free way then i really think that those two ways are, are are a very good very good start and you really must make sure that you have enough collateral cash that again that you are not comfortable or i mean you are comfortable of uh, losing potentially because you know like, like like i said this i'm only doing this for about 15 percent of, of, of my portfolio right because you know like i am i will not lose my sleep if i i mean it was it was so stuck but i you know i will not lose my sleep you know if i potentially you know lose everything the next day yeah so i want you to um make some comments now about how compatible you think this strategy is with like a grad student lifestyle and we're talking both income like available money to be invested and of course again we're only talking about a percentage of that total portfolio right right, right. Um, and also the time so like you mentioned earlier I think there was a little bit of time invested to learn the strategy and you were you know playing around with a simulation um, and then you actually start doing it but once you are familiar and comfortable, it sounds like it's a fairly low time commitment on like the daily or weekly basis, right? To actually execute the trades. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, honestly, like the actual like trading itself takes, you know, maybe less than three seconds. You know, like as long as you set your own strike price that you're comfortable with, and as long as you are, you know, like consistent with what you want to sell it for or buy it for, then um, it really just you know, like usually, you know, like I do both of my options on Monday because, you know, technically I, because Monday is when the, the new market opens on this holiday and then the option contract expire usually on Fridays. So usually selling a weekly um, put or cover call on the same week, I think is a very good consistent income. Now, sometimes, you know, like I do a little bit of longer calls, I mean, longer um, contracts if I feel like, you know, I can, I can get more premium um, because, you know, the longer your contract are, the more premium you will get. So sometimes if I feel like a stock, you know, might not potentially move for maybe another like two weeks or so, right? Then, you know, I could consider doing that for a longer time, which means the next week, I'll just t t take a week off or something because I don't actually have to worry about, um, you know, like losing, you know, maybe a premium in that sense. Um, yeah. So like, honestly, like once you are just, once you sort of reach that phase of, you know, I've learned how to do options. I, I kind of know what I'm doing. Right. Um, 
once you sort of like, I think, pass the barrier, I think from there it becomes a very, very passive thing. And that's the reason why I chose to participate in this podcast because I really, because, you know, when we do, when we talk about, you know, like passive income, passive income, you know, and side hustles, most, you know, side hustles that, that, that we're familiar with, you know, usually requires some kind of a time commitment. You know, we, you know, we spend about, you know, an hour or two tutoring. We spend an hour or two, you know, maybe doing a, being a tour guide or something, or, you know, like it could be some kind of a, you know, participant in some you know, case study, right? But I think with options, you know, it's very great because it doesn't require you to actually exchange your active time for money. Because once you sort of like, you know, have a system, right, it's kind of like, you know, you are generating your own, you know, machine that gives you your own passive income. Now, you know, don't get me wrong, like, there, again, there are risks to options trading. So, you know, don't think that everyone's an expert because I definitely lost some money during, during this, um, you know, but for me, like, you know, as long because I was very consistent over time and I was very um, um, keen to what my what I believe and I was very um, committed to my um, purchases and you know, all that stuff, I was able to make a slowly but substantial income that I still have today and I'm still looking forward to you know keep on doing this you know hopefully until I graduate and um, by then who knows what's gonna happen. So kind of one more follow up question on that like I understand that you you kind of said once you set up this like system or like machine it you know consistently yes there's risks but you can you have generated a fairly consistent uh, passive income from this but I guess I'm more wondering about how you're figuring out like you know you've mentioned several individual stocks as examples so far in our conversation like there's whatever thousands of stocks to choose from like how do you actually figure out which ones you're going to be making these bets on like what resources do you use. Yeah, that's a very good question. So when you talk about like stocks that are deemed considered safe, so there are actually many measurements you can actually learn about this. So um, so basically when I first got into stock, got it, you know, really into investing, I actually read the book called The Intelligent Investor. I actually have it here. Um, let, me, let me pull it right now. So it's called The Intelligent Investor by um, Benjamin Graham. So now you can see this uh, right here. And basically this is a really good book because it actually really sh um, shows you a lot about how to you know, pick the stocks that are right for you. Essentially, you know, there are two, like, you know, great measurements of a stock that you can, right? Because remember, when we do a cover call, you want to choose a stock that has a fairly low volatility that does not tend to move up and down pricing too much, right? So, you know, a good example would be Google, right? Google or Apple, right? Those two, you know, are very big, you know, big blue chip stocks that have already performed very, very well. Right. So, so these are called, you know, large market cap stocks because these companies have already grown and, you know, the amount of growth that they are projecting forward is a lot less compared to, let's say, new SPAC companies that have just, you know, IPO'd and, you know, these companies have a lot more, you know, potential to grow, right? So, I mean, you know, if you're looking for, let's say, just growth stock investing, then you should not do options on them personally because, you know, these like I said, these growth stocks can either go both ways and, you know, because of the high volatility, you might receive more premium but you have a much higher risk of losing all your money. So I would personally stay away from any of those companies that has a very small market cap, right? And you know, market cap simply means it's the total asset of a company. So you can basically multiply the share price times the number of shares. That's how you get market cap. The other measurement is actually a measurement called beta. So I don't know if you're familiar with beta, but beta is basically a comparison to the S&P 500 index. And for those who are not familiar with the S&P 500, the S&P 500 basically is a, is, is a way to think about the U.S. economy as a whole, right? So if your S&P 500 sort of grows on this path, then we can kind of expect that the U.S. economy also follows that trajectory, essentially. So if your beta for a stock is one, that means that beta, that stock essentially aligns parallel to the S&P 500. So an example of a stock that would beta one is actually Google. Right. Google basically, if you actually look at the um, the past um, chart of Google versus the S&P, right, we can actually see that they're actually largely overlap together, you know, mainly because, you know, those two companies are very, they flow correctly, you know, they sort of flow in the same trajectory, right? So if I were to, you know, recommend an options or, or as a stock to do options on, I would choose a stock with a very low beta or with, with, with beta that's close to one as possible, mainly because we know those stocks are a lot less volatile compared to other stocks, right? You know, don't do, don't, please don't do, you know, options on, you know, like stuff like Tesla, right? Because we know Tesla, you know, goes like up and down in you know, like so many ways. So it's really, it's really, really risky to, um, you know, do those kind of options, you know, like unless you, unless you have a lot of money, a lot of money to lose, right? 
And the, and the third measurement that I also look at is something called the PE ratio. So that, that's called the price to earnings ratio. And typically, um, um, I mean, some people say that PE ratio is a measurement of a company's you know, future performances. But usually I like to basically use a metric where the PE ratio for a company um, typically should be around 20 or lower. And basically with that measurement, that usually means that the company has already grown too much, you know, has a lot of built-in growth and there are a lot of less growth potential possible in the future. So it's kind of it's kind of like Google. So Google also has a fairly low P ratio because you know they also have grown so much this, this past you know you know couple decades that um you know we don't expect Google to you know become like a master um like you know large cap stock in the future. So I would you know like you could actually search up these stocks on Yahoo Finance and actually look at their charts and you know these charts will actually display all the parameters that I talk about beta P ratio market cap all that stuff. And you know, if you are always, you know, if you are interested in learning more about this stuff, there are plenty of resources out there online. The one source that I really like is is a source called Investopedia, actually. So Investopedia actually is Investopedia is basically like an encyclopedia with all the investment terms. So you know, like if you if you want to know more about you know what is a large cap company versus a low cap company, what is a PE ratio, what is a beta, you know, what are call options, you know, you will be able to find individual articles in all of these. Um, so, um, it. Again, it takes a little bit of time and practice to be familiar with these, but I personally think that as long as you are comfortable and as long as you are interested in making money, then I think these are very good strategies that we, we could um, potentially incorporate in our daily, daily lifestyle, especially if you like investing. Sounds really attractive. Um, so for your personal portfolio, do you mind sharing how long you've been doing this for, um, how much money you've made or how much your portfolio has grown? Um, and how much time you think you've put into the research and the execution? So this year alone. So if I were to, you know, just just add up all of my total put credit spreads that I've made from January to till now, I have about $7,322. Um, and that is because I was able to do this on a weekly basis. You know, I was I was selling spy puts um put credit spreads on three times a day and eventually you know those money has been accumulating and compounding and quite frankly that's that's the reason why i was actually able to you know you know accumulate a little bit more capital to start you know selling puts remember to sell put options we need cash collateral so because now i had a little bit of cash now i'm able to you know use this put option strategies to actually sell puts on companies that i'm willing to buy so basically, like, you know, I think you can see what I'm getting here. You know, as long as you're consistent, as long as you are um, committed to your goals, I really think that in the long picture, right, the money will compound over its own. And, you know, I, I am a very strong believer that anyone can, you know, be, you know, be, um, you know, achieve great wealth, no matter what kind of income that you're making. So I am, I personally think that as long as you have the right mindset, as long as you have the right strategy for it, then anyone can do this. That includes grad students. I love the way you put that. I don't, I don't have anything to add to that except to just say that $7,000 in, let's see, we're in November now. So almost a year of what is essentially like a side hustle. Um, you know, not that active. You're not spending a lot, a lot of time on it. Right, um, right. Mm -hmm. It's a very decent rate of return, especially for a graduate student. So yeah. This is very exciting. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's been really a pleasure for me to learn more about this. Um, so thank you so much for volunteering to be on the podcast. I want to conclude with the question that I ask of all my guests, which is what is your best financial advice for another early career PhD? And it could be something related to what we've talked about today or something completely else. Yeah. So this is actually not a financial advice, but this is actually a very good, I think a very good personal habit that everybody should employ. And that is to wake up early. Um, so the reason why I started waking up early was actually frankly because the stock market in California um, opens at 6.30 and you know like you know if, if I'm you know trying to get the best bets out of this right you know usually I like to do most of my trades in the morning um, but honestly you know quite frankly like after I started to have a very um, prosperous morning habits I realized that I have a lot I feel like I have a lot more time in my day right because you know when we wake up at let's say 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., right? It, you know, like we tend to be, you know, feel I think more lazier than what we, you know, them, you know, because the, the, the sun's already out and you know we already hear people outside. So I I really feel like having fostering this kind of like like an early morning routine is a very good habit I think for really anyone, right? Because um, not only 
not only it feels like you have more time, but I, I think that, you know, in the morning when people are, you know, mostly asleep, typically, um, you, you usually like um, I get less, less distracted and I, I tend to get more work done in the morning personally. I, I have to say that I concur and it was, it's even a surprise to me. Well, it was so good to meet you, Min Sub. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing about this topic. New to me, new to probably many of the listeners, but really exciting to learn about. Um, so thank you. It was great to have you on. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Listeners, thank you for joining me for this episode. I have a gift for you. You know that final question I ask of all my guests regarding their best financial advice? I have collected short summaries of all the answers ever given on the podcast into a document that is updated with each new episode release. You can gain access to it by registering for my mailing list at pfforphds.com advice. Would you like to access transcripts or videos of each episode? I link the show notes for each episode from pfforphds.com slash podcast. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here are three ways you can help it grow. One, subscribe to the podcast and rate and review it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever platform you use. Two, share an episode you found particularly valuable on social media, with an email listserv, or as a link from your website. Three, recommend me as a speaker to your university or association. My seminars cover the personal finance topics PhDs are most interested in, like investing, debt repayment, and increasing cash flow. I also license pre-recorded workshops on taxes. See you in the next episode, and remember, you don't have to have a PhD to succeed with personal finance, but it helps. The music is Stages of Awakening by Poddington Bear from the Free Music Archive and is shared under CC by NC. Podcast editing by Lourdes Bobio and show notes creation by Miriam Ock.